I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I take a moment to thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to this episode of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Now, you can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com. Now, just a little bit of information for the listeners before I move on. I have to say that this is a pre-recorded canned episode that was that's not going to have any news. It's an evergreen episode. Now, you may be wondering exactly what an evergreen episode is, and I'll touch on that in a moment. However, let me go out on a limb and say that basically I want to have something in reserve so that if I'm unable to do the podcast, you're not without content. So, with that said, let me give you some information on how to get the show, and I'll do that via an audio clip, or via an audio clip. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, and in the Microsoft Windows podcast store. Of course, you can always download the show and see the show notes, as well as comment by going to the website, Gun Rights in Texas. Now, as I said just a moment ago, this is an evergreen show, and you may kind of wonder exactly what's going on here. Well, basically, an evergreen episode is one that I record and I hold it back, and the content applies no matter when you listen to it, the content's still good, or for the most part, it's going to still be good. And thus, it's evergreen. It's good now, it's good next month, it's good next year if it has to wait that long. And if it waits too long, I'll go ahead and release it as a special release. Unfortunately, I have a sneaking suspicion that because of what I got going on with work in the next couple of weeks, this episode's going to be released pretty soon. And my goal is to actually have two or three of these episodes held in reserve. That way, if I miss two or three weeks because of work or illness or equipment failures or whatever, there's podcast for you to download. And before I go any further, let me point out that yes, I am still doing the YouTube video thing. I don't know if by the time you hear this that I have changed it, but the little audio clip you heard earlier does not include YouTube. Well, I'm still doing that, at least when I'm recording this Evergreen episode, and you're actually going to be able to see the guns I'm talking about when I talk about them, because I have still photos I'm going to insert into the video. That's right, there's a video, it's just there's not moving pictures, There's it's kind of like a slideshow. So, because this is an evergreen episode, there's not going to be any news, at least I don't plan for there to be any news included, and the reason for that is, well, I'd have to go back and edit it, and that would kind of defeat the purpose of having an evergreen episode. So, let me go ahead and do the promo for the social media, and then we'll move on to actually talking about the subject at hand. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on social media. Links to all the social media profiles can be found on the website. On Twitter, the podcast is at Gun Rights in TX. On Facebook and Google Plus, it is Gun Rights in Texas. So please be social. God, that's corny. The And please be social. I got to do something about that. I don't know. I may leave it alone. We'll see. However, the episode for this episode is the 45s. Well, the topic for this show is four different 45 caliber handguns from different manufacturers. And I've got four examples of different platforms. Well, the first one is one that's near and dear to my heart, and it's able to switch between 45 Auto and 45 Colt. And that would be the Ruger New Vaquero 45 Convertible, or Convertible. And I say new Vaquero, even though the gun just says Ruger Vaquero. Actually, I think this one says new Vaquero on the side. However, it's new Vaquero because it's the smaller frame version that is almost, not quite, but almost dimensionally the same as the old Colt single action army guns. Now, the second gun is a little more controversial, especially to the Glock guys. I didn't have a Glock, so I got the closest thing I had. And that would be the Springfield Armory XDM. 4.5 4.5 chambered in 45 auto. Now the next two choices are ones that I am really comfortable shooting as well, and that would be the Sig Sauer P220 Extreme, and I have a representative from the 1911 family, which if I'm talking about the 45 auto, I cannot leave out the 1911. So, 
The 1911 that I'm using for this episode is a little bit controversial because people, some people love this brand, some people hate this brand, and that would be Kimber. And this particular gun is a custom TLE-2. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Kimber's uh, naming system, custom is not a designation that the gun is a custom-made or customized unit. Custom basically means it's a 5-inch barrel model. Kind of corny, I know, but that's how Kimber designates their models. Custom is a 5-inch. The uh, Pro is the 4-inch. And then I think the Pro is the 4-inch. But anyways, they got three different names that really don't tie into the size of the gun to use that they use to describe the size of the gun. It's kind of a stupid convention, but it's theirs, and that's how they do it. So let's move on and talk about the, sh uh, talk about the actual guns themselves. Now, if you're looking at the video right about now, you should see the uh, Ruger uh, Nuva Carol 45 convertible. Now, I'm not showing the extra cylinder in the photo because what would be the point? The cylinder in the gun looks the same as the other cylinder in the gun. Now, in the photo, for those who are wondering which cylinder that is, that's the 45 auto cylinder. This particular handgun is actually one of my favorites, and that's because I learned to shoot handguns with a single action revolver. Now, the Nuva Carol is popular in the cowboy action shooting market simply because of its dimensionally similar or dimensional similarity to the Colt single action army. And acknowledging that uh, Ruger has released uh, special packages that include two pistols with consecutive serial numbers prefixed with SASS, which is single action shooting sports. That's the uh, body that kind of governs cowboy action shooting. Now, another group of variants for this that are ex available as dealer exclusives are the convertibles. The Nuva Caro convertibles are available in 9mm and 357 Magnum, which means the 357 Magnum cylinder can shoot 38 Special. And it's available as a 45 convertible like mine, which lets you shoot the 45 Auto and the 45 Long Colt, as some people refer to it. But it's actually 45 Colt. Long story there, but basically when the 45 Auto came into the world, people referred to it as a 45 Colt as well. To differentiate between the two, some people incorrectly referred to the 45 Auto as 45 Short Colt, and those same people referred to the 45 Colt as the 45 Long Colt. Well, fortunately, the former did not stick around. However, unfortunately, the latter did. Now, one advantage I really like about this 45 convertible is that when I'm shooting 45 Auto, I can use a 1911 magazine as a speed loader. And some people may be wondering how that works. Well, the way it works is you grip the barrel of the gun. The gun's uh, been discharged five or six times, depending on if you're carrying an empty round in the chamber. But it's got the transfer bar safety, so you can carry all six cylinders or all six chambers in the cylinder loaded. But you grip the gun by the barrel in your weak hand. You use your thumb to rotate the cylinder after you open the loading gate. And you use the finger on your left hand to work the ejector rod. Well, after you eject around, let the ejector rod go, take your 1911 magazine, and slide around into the cylinder. Take your thumb, rotate to the next one, ejector rod, release, load, rotate. It works very well for me. It took a little while to perfect it. I can't tell you which finger I use for that because I don't have the gun in my hand. It's locked up in my safe. And, you know, some people may be wondering why I would do that. Well, those people are the ones that listen to older episodes that know I keep a gun on the desk when I'm recording the podcast to kind of keep the, it's to keep my eye on the goal, basically. Well, the gun I have on my desk right now doesn't belong to me. It's sitting there for two reasons. One, so I can keep my eye on the goal. And two, so when my friend shows up to pick up the gun that he took apart and could not put back together, I can hand it back to him. But I'll go into detail about that one in a moment. Well, not in detail. I'll tell you the story behind that in a moment. However, you know, I really like this gun, but two problems I have with it are the fact that the hammer lacks the half cock notch, and when I'm cocking the hammer on this thing, it's single action. you got to cock the hammer to shoot it. When I'm cocking the hammer, I hear click, click. I do not hear click, 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 click. And for those who are familiar with the old Colts and the true single action style guns that are based off those Colts, the four clicks are important. The newer guns don't need it, especially when they have the transfer bar safety, just like they don't need the half-cock notch. And some people say, well, the half-cock notch is a safety feature. No, it's not. It's where you put the hammer so you can load the gun. It's not a safety feature. The safety feature on a single-action revolver 
that does not have a transfer bar safety is hammer down on an empty cylinder. I could do a whole episode talking about single action guns, so let me kind of move back onto the topic and say that the single action Ruger of New Vaquero is not an ideal solution for very many people, especially when you consider it as a daily carry. I am probably one of a handful of people that are able to say they would be comfortable carrying this gun and they could run it in this situation. But that's because I learned to shoot on this platform. It's second nature to me. And before I carried it, I would go out there and I'd practice and train on it just to make sure I was up to the, up to par. But yeah, I could run this platform and carry it uh, and be comfortable carrying it for self-defense. Now, the cowboy action shooters, they would be in that uh, handful of people. So, you know, you got to select few people that are going to say, yeah, I'm comfortable doing this. But there's not going to be very many. So let me just say, I don't have a concealment holster for it. I don't think they even make one for these. Although I have been tempted, and I will admit this, I have been tempted to have one made for this gun. However, I have more modern options available that are more standardized that if I end up having to use them, well, I'm probably not going to have as many questions about my weapon selection if it goes to court. And, you know, the fewer questions you can be asked in court, the less chance for somebody to twist your words or confuse the jury or anything like that. So, really, it's a better deal not to carry this gun. But you know what? Before I go any further, let me just throw out some specifications and some other information about the gun. The model number on this one is 5144. It has a six-round capacity, and because it's a revolver, there's no plus one. It is a single-action-only firearm. The sights are fixed. This particular one is stainless. It weighs 40 ounces, has an MSRP of $847. Now, while this is evergreen content, the MSRP might change. And for the retail information, it's not currently available. It's a distributor exclusive. It's not made all that often. But if you look around, you can find them. And they do, on occasion, make another run of these, and you can get them then. So the next gun in the uh, lineup is the Springfield Armory XDM 4.5-inch barrel in 45 auto. Now, when the XDM line of pistols from Springfield Armory came out, I was an early adopter. I probably picked this thing up the day it was announced. And it was announced at SHOT Show in January of, I don't remember when they were. But that gun that I picked up when the XDM line was released was a 40 caliber. And the reason for that is the 40 calibers were released first, then the 9mm, and then a little bit later they came along and said, you know, we could do the 45, and when they released the 45, I bought one of them too. Now the XDM line of pistols is a step up over the XD series. It still retains many of the features from the older line, and the older line is still in production. However, one advantage the XDM 45 has over the 40 and 9mm versions of the same gun is that it can use the 45 caliber mags from the XD series. Now, the XD line has expanded to include single stack models aimed at concealed carry, which would be the XDS. And my friend Ray, who co-hosts the Pro Gun Podcast with me, if I can ever get around to having time with him where we can do an episode, that particular gun is one that we need to review here too. But like I said, you know, when, when the XDM came out, I purchased one of the first ones. In fact, mine is one of the ones that lack the word match on the barrel. And there's a certificate of authenticity that explains that. But when I bought it, one of the reasons I bought the gun was I picked it up. I was uh, feeling the gun out and I was told to dry fire it by the dealer. I pressed the trigger and I fell in love. It had an excellent trigger from the factory. And when the 45 Auto version came out, I had to have one. I figured, well, the trigger on the 40 is pretty dang good. So... The trigger on the 45 will at least be good. Wrong. That's right. Wrong. I bought the I bought the 45, got it into the dealer because I did, ordered it. I didn't have a chance to actually handle the gun before I bought it. If I had, I would have moved on and found a different one. Picked it up, dry fired. The trigger was horrible. It was almost bad enough. I thought about calling Springfield Army up saying, hey, what's the deal here? One of the guys at the gun store had a gauge and the trigger was so bad. His 13-pound gauge on his trigger gauge would not register the trigger on this thing. So I take it home, detail strip it, and lo and behold, some of the trigger parts are not to spec. I could call Springfield Army up, get them to uh, get a shipping label, ship the gun back, wait a little while, get my gun back from them, 
and it would probably have been okay. Maybe it would have been the same trigger as what I had on the 40. Who knows? But I don't look at problems as obstacles. I look at them as opportunities. So I ordered a trigger kit, a drop-in trigger kit that would need to be fitted. Unfortunately, to get the trigger to where I was happy with it involved several trips to the range. And I live about 10, 12 miles from the range. So I would adjust the trigger, go out to the range, test fire it. Uh, it needs a little more work. Come back, take a little more off, go back. Uh, needs more work. Go back. Did that about, uh, God, I don't know how many times I went to the range just to fire two or three shots and decide, nope, trigger's not good. Most of the time I went through a box of ammo, but sometimes it's just two or three shots. Anyways, I come back. And a lot of it was dealing with the reset on the trigger. But then I hit the sweet spot. And the trigger on this thing is now beautiful. So, I have this XDM45 with an aftermarket trigger that has been fitted to the gun. And it is beautiful. I mean, out of the box, the trigger kit was actually better than the uh, trigger that was included with the gun on the 40. But because it was a fit-to-function trigger, you had to fit it because there would be reliability issues if you didn't. I fitted it, got the thing dialed in, and now it's perfect. However, there was more than that that we had to contend with. I had to break the gun in. It would fit the same holsters as the XD40 or XDM40, so I didn't have to get a different holster. However, because it's an aftermarket trigger, a lot of people would recommend you don't carry that gun. And I don't blame them. I mean, it's one less thing you might have to explain in court, and the fewer things you have to explain in court, if you ever have to use a gun, the fewer things that can be turned against you, and the fewer things that, well, can confuse the jury. So let's go into some specs on this. The model number on this one is a big old long convoluted thing, not as bad as the next guns, but still long convoluted. It is XDM 9454, or wrong. I was l looking at it a little wrong. It's... I was going to say 94, 54, 54, but it's actually XDM 94, 54, 5 BHC. This gun has a capacity of 13 rounds plus one being a semi-auto. It's a double action only, which the double action only guns really are a hybrid between double action and single action. The XDM, the XD, the XDS, they don't move the striker anywhere near as much as say a Smith & Wesson Sigma or a Glock. So they're less double action and more single action. But the ATF basically classifies uh, the striker fired guns such as the XD and the XD, the Glock and all those as being double action only. So as a result, the action is listed as double action only. The sights are a three dot sight. They're drift adjustable. They're not night sights which is the one thing I would have done different if I had if I went back and bought the gun again. Well, one of two things I'd do different. I'd make sure I felt the gun before I bought it, and then I'd make sure I got night sights. Eventually, I'll send the gun in and have it changed out to actual night sights, but the thing about XD series guns, the sights are pressed in with so they're so tight that you pretty much have to have a special machine to get them out and get the new ones in. Now, materials on this one, it's a polymer frame with a forged steel slide. It weighs in at 31 ounces and has an MSRP of $709. And once again, you know, the MSRP may change between now and when the episode's released, but you get an idea. And a gun should always sell for less than MSRP. Now, the next gun I want to talk about is a Sig Sauer P220 Extreme. Sig Sauer traces its history all the way back to 1853 as a Swiss wagon company or wagon factory. Many people, myself included, were often referred to Sig Sauer simply as Sig. Now, the Sig P220 made its way into the United States around 1985. There's a couple different variations. Magazines are not compatible between some of the variations. There's variations with a European magazine release, which is on the heel of the gun. And then there's some that have a, uh, an American-style mag release, which is a button on the left side of the frame. Uh, well, on the left side of the grip frame. Now, SIG has had quite a few products, and those products tend to have a reputation for quality. The SIG P220, in my opinion, is one of the best 45 caliber handguns made, or ever made, in my opinion. So, that's my opinion, but you may have something different in mind. SIG Sour products are often controversial. Or garble. SIG Sour. They used to make good stuff, but they make junk now. 
or water garble, six sour, only six sour, all others bad, kind of like the Glock fanboys, and you see them in reverse as well. However, in my case, I found this particular P220 is such a good deal, I could not walk away from it. Although, I really like my SIGs like I like my 1911s, and that's without rails. This particular gun is a 6 hour P220 Extreme. It features a rail, unfortunately. The short reset trigger, the G10 grips, the night sights, and all the typical features of a P220 that's made for the U.S. market currently. Aside from the grips, the beaver tail, and the adjustable sights, the Elite and the Extreme are really the same gun for the most part, or at least the uh, the Elite Dark. In fact, the slide on the Extreme actually says Elite. Part of that's because they wanted both guns to have forward cocking serrations. I don't really see a need for them, but okay. And part of that's because the slide for the Elite was done a little differently and it works well for the Extreme package as well. Now, when I first got this gun, I got a concealment holster for it and I carried it twice. However, a friend of mine who only owned a P220 for concealed carry, he didn't have anything else. He got his license in. He didn't have a holster. He was between jobs at that time. Basically, he had a situation where he had a non-compete clause and he had money built up to last him through, but he couldn't exactly go out and be buying things willy-nilly. He needed a holster. So I made him a deal. I told him, okay, I've got a holster for a P220 with a rail. I'll let you have that holster. And when you go back to work, you can pay me back. Well, I never have replaced the holster. He paid me for it, but I never replaced the holster. And now I don't have a holster for my P220. If it wasn't for the fact I don't have a holster for it, I'd carry it uh, more often than, than some of my other options, but I tend to carry different guns for different reasons. However, I, let me say this. Eventually, I will get another holster for it, but it's not really that high of a priority. I have enough options with enough holsters for them as it is that I don't have to worry about it. So let me give you some uh, specs on this gun. And the model number on this one's even longer than the XDM. The model on this one is the P220R-45-XTM-BLKGRY. That's a 220 with a rail, 45, extreme, black and gray. Now the gun's a single stack, so it's got a capacity of 8 plus 1. It's got a uh, double action, single action trigger, and as a safety mechanism, it features a decocking lever. It does have three dot sights. They are night sights, and they are drift adjustable. The material on this gun are the materials in this gun are an alloy frame with a stainless steel slide. The grips are G10 grips, so you kind of got some modern materials mixed in with some older materials. The gun weighs in at 30.4 ounces, and that's kind of a cookie cutter weight that they use i think the gun weighs a little less than that in actuality which is interesting that it weighs less than the polymer framed xdm msrp is 1239 dollars so you should find it about you should find it around 1100 or maybe as little as 1050 if you look you know like i said you know the prices are subject to change even though this is an evergreen episode keep in mind that the price i just stated may not be the current price when you hear the episode. And that leaves us with one other handgun for this episode. And once again, we have a little bit of a controversial manufacturer that would be Kimber and the models the custom TLE2. Now, Kimber America has an interesting history to say the least. Kimber is known for their 1911 pattern pistols and their rifles. The TLE2 was originally developed for the LAPD SWAT team. However, outside of that, it has become a market success, so it stays in production. And they have introduced the Pro and the, uh, I forget the other size. But they have introduced the other two sizes, from what I understand. Now, this particular gun is the full-size custom model. And that means it's got the 5-inch barrel, and it pretty much follows the standard 1911 pattern. My particular TLE2 was purchased after I talked with some of the local sheriff's deputies and they explained to me how they were satisfied with their stainless steel TLE-2s. The only complaint the deputies had about theirs at that time was the magazines had reliability issues. Their solution was to replace the factory mags with those from a manufacturer that was known for reliability. My particular TLE-2 has a reputation for reliability that is kind of a... It's kind of above and beyond what you normally see. Part of that's because I do good maintenance on it, and part of it's because 
the gun's a quality firearm. Now, this particular 1911, the, my TLE-2, was the subject of one of the uh, thousand round challenge tests that we did on the Pro Gun Podcast. Now, our thousand round challenge was different than some of the others. We didn't have a thousand rounds of ammunition loaded up and just rip and roar and get the gun really hot and see if it failed. Our thousand round challenge that we did was a thousand rounds without cleaning. We'd shoot anywhere from 50 to 200 rounds at a time. There at the end, we shot a little over, I want to say we shot a little over 400 rounds. I don't remember. It's been a while. However, we gave the weapon multiple heat cycles, no cleaning, no lubricating. And the idea was to let the grime sit, let the gun heat up and expand, cool down and shrink, and stress the parts. The gun went through it with no problems. Took it apart. It was a little stiff getting it apart to clean it after the 1,000-round challenge. But I think we ended up with 1,024 rounds through it. It was a joke about it being, instead of a 1,000-round challenge, it was a 1K challenge. 1K being computer 1,000, which is 1024. However, being a, your typical 1911 pattern gun, you know, there's a major aftermarket for it, although a lot of parts would have to be fitted. The gun's out there. It's available. I don't have a model number, but it's a custom TLE-2 from Kimber America. Capacity is 7 plus 1. Of course, that's with the magazines I use in it. I think it ships with an 8-round magazine. It was a funky little magazine that I did not like, so I took the magazine out, placed it on a cinder block, and stomped it. I have plenty of 1911 magazines. They're all magazines that are quality made. They work well. They have new springs because I maintain my stuff. So in my case, the gun's a 7 plus 1 gun. I don't use flush fit magazines that hold more than seven rounds on a 1911. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it works. Now then, it's a single action only firearm. Being a 1911, you kind of expect that. It's got three dot night sights. They are drift adjustable. The frame and the slide are both steel. It's the heaviest gun we got in this little agreement, except for the Ruger. And it weighs in at 38 ounces. It's only two ounces lighter than the Ruger. MSRP on it's 1080 so if you go around, if you go look for it, you can probably find it for around 900 or so, but don't, don't quote me on that because this is an evergreen episode and the prices are subject to change, and I'm just basing this off of, we got an MSRP of 1080 and the gun usually sells for less than MSRP because the manufacturers like to have MSRP where the dealers can use it as an arguing point. Well, you know, MSRP is this, but I'll cut you a deal and let you have it for that. And everybody walks away thinking they got a good deal. Well, each of these guns kind of target a different mar- market. Blah, let me get my tongue untied. You know, the Ruger Vaquero targets the cowboy action shooting market. The XDM, due to its size, is more for the competitive shooting market. I mean, they do have com- competition models, but the XDM is really aimed at the, comp- at the competitive shooting market, really. Although, people like me have been known to conceal carry this thing. The SIG P220 is more or less targeted at law enforcement in the open carry markets. Although, while it is a big, bulky gun, especially for a single stack, it's not like trying to conceal carry a 45 caliber Glock or an XDM. It's done easier than you would think. Now, the TLE2 fits in a lot of different markets. It's kind of like, hey, Shiny 1911 with a blue finish. Actually, it's not blued. It's uh, that bizarro Kimber finish. But anyways, you got it. You got the idea. Here's a shiny 1911. So you get the 1911 fanboys, which are almost as bad as the Glock fanboys. You have the you have the gun kind of, you know, being the TLE2. You know, it's got the pedigree from the LAPD SWAT team. The thin size of the 1911 lends it to concealed carry very well. So when you get right down to it, this gun fits so many different markets in so many different ways that it's really hard to pin down a single market it's good for. Now the trigger on the 1911, including the TLE-2, makes it very well suited for competition. Now I'm just going to go ahead and wrap this up right here, right now, and say that We're not going to touch on a featured firearm because we basically had four for this episode, although they're not featured firearms. I thought about talking on the, on a, well, I had a few different guns I thought about doing as a featured firearm, but really it's pointless. It's basically more of what you heard, but it would be breaking from the theme of the podcast. So let's just uh, go ahead and get ready to wrap this up. However, 
After I do the promo, I'll tell you a little bit about the gun that's sitting on my desk. So, or not the promo, but the audio clip. So here you go. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. All righty. Now then, we've got the show just about wrapped up. We're at the uh, point where I want to thank people, but a friend of mine called me. And he said, hey, I've got, I've got this uh, 22. I've taken it apart, and I can't get it back together. Now, many listeners are already uh, pinpointing the exact, um, the exact series of gun that, I, that I've got in my, or sitting on my desk. And for those who don't automatically know what I'm referring to, I've got a Ruger. In this case, it's a uh, Ruger Standard sitting on my desk. It could be worse. It could be a Mark III. On the Mark III, you have to do the hokey pokey to get it all together correctly. On the standard, you only have to do the hokey and not the pokey. However, he couldn't get the gun back together, and he brought it to me. And I told him, well, you know, the bolt's still crusted up pretty bad. He goes, yeah, I just can't get it real clean. So I did him a favor. I took his bolt, and then I, I, happened, to, I happened to have something that'll clean the bolt on the uh, Mark II, Mark III, the Ruger Standard, the Ruger uh, Mark I. And I got his bolt cleaned up for him. And then put the gun back together. He's supposed to be by today and pick it up. And that's why it's sitting on the desk. That's why it's the gun that's got my eyes on the prize, as you, as some people might say. Well, the thing about the Ruger Standard is the Ruger Standard was the first gun Ruger produced. A lot of people refer to them as Mark 1s, although the Mark 1 was the target model for the Standard. When they revised it and went to the Mark 2, the Mark 2 covered the whole uh, line. Now, in my safe, I do have a Standard. And I have a couple of Mark Threes. Eventually, I'll and I may start collecting the Ruger Standard Series. I don't know. That'd be an interesting collection. A lot of pain and suffering to clean, but it'd be an interesting collection. I may do that now that I've thought about it. However, let me just go on to say I'd like to thank. Uh, well, in this episode, I'd like to thank the listeners for listening. Obviously, I would like to thank everybody that's involved in the fight for gun rights in Texas, and more importantly. I want to thank those that uh, that when they get an alert from the NRA or the TSRA, they go out and they act on it. We need more people to do that. So let me hit the music, and after the music, I'll do the New to Guns in Texas segment, and the show will be over. If you don't want to hear something that's very basic and probably not something that an experienced shooter would be interested in, well, then you might want to go ahead and just simply hit the button and stop the show after this. Or when the music starts, you might want to hit the button. However, if you are having trouble finding a shooting range, you might want to stick around and listen. So sign off music, and then we're going to have the new to shooting in Texas or new to guns in Texas segment. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Now, for those who are new to guns and uh, all that, we're going to talk about finding a range to shoot at. And this really isn't just for Texas. This is something that everybody that's involved in shooting sports that's moving to a new location or they're in a different state. It still applies to them as well. Well, we're not going to really go into too much detail and talk about things like the different types of ranges, but we're going to tell you how to find one. And the first resource you should consider, especially if you're a new shooter, is your instructor. Obviously, your instructor has access to a range, and they may be able to tell you how to gain access to that same range for yourself, or they may be able to tell you where to go to get access to a different range. Another resource you can use to find a range is your local gun store or gun club. Considering that people need a place to shoot when they buy guns or they join a club, well, these these two entities have a vested interest in knowing where there are gun ranges. After all, if you can't go shoot it, why are you going to buy a gun?
right? Well, some people say, well, self-defense. Yeah, you have to be able to shoot it in advance so you're competent and qualified with it, even if you're not having to qualify for a license or anything like that. You still have to be competent and qualified with that weapon to be able to use it responsibly. So yeah, you want to be able to go shoot it. So basically, go, you know, if these places can't sell you a membership or sell you a uh sell you a firearm without you being able to use it, there's no point in buying whatever they're offering. Now a lot of gun uh, blah 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 tongue tied there. A lot of gun clubs actually exist to maintain or manage a range. That's the whole purpose of a lot of gun clubs. So a lot of gun clubs, you can join them, and then you have access to the range that they run, own, or manage, or that they maintain. Now there is one more resource you can use to find a gun range, and this one is well nationwide. That would be the National Shooting Sports Foundation's Where to Shoot dot org. It has a lot more available than just a database of ranges throughout the country, but for this episode, we're going to touch on the database of ranges throughout the country. I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to pull it up on my computer, wheretoshoot.org. It immediately redirects to wheretoshoot.org index2.cfm. Ooh, cubic feet per minute. No, I'm kidding. I'm a car guy. I see CFM, I think cubic feet per minute. And right there at the top, you got uh, five different resources at list. Find a place to shoot. List your range, videos, resources, and about. Well, we're going to click on find a place to shoot, and it pulls up a list. It's either by state or, or not the list, but it pulls up some options to search by. You can choose by state, or you can choose by distance from a zip code. So let's do this. Let's choose distance from a zip code. We will go with the here in West Texas. 60 miles is nothing, so we'll go 60 miles, and we'll choose Seminole, Texas as a zip code, 79360. I know that because I work in Seminole. And as far, then you can customize your search. You can search by sport or amenities, which means a women's slash youth program, shotgun, rifle, retail, instruction slash rentals, archery, handgun. So we're going to choose handgun, and we're going to choose rifle. Then we're going to hit find range. And it shows one Hobbs Gun Club, Hobbs, New Mexico, 88240, as being 27.1 miles from Seminole. We're going to hit the back button, and we're just going to choose handgun. And it goes back to Hobbs Gun Club. Hmm. Now, I know there's a range in here, so that's more or less a handgun range, although it does rifle as well. So we're going to choose all and find a range. And there we go. It shows the ones that I want. It shows Gaines County Sheriff's Office, Seminole, Texas, 793600, zero miles. It's actually about 10 miles out of Seminole. Under faculty details, it's private, outdoor, and law enforcement. Well, the thing is, you call the Sheriff's Office, you get permission, and they'll give you a key. You go out there, shoot, and you take the key back and make sure you've cleaned up when you're done. Then there's Gaines County Shooting Range, Seminole, Texas. This one, if it's the one I think it is, is the 4-H range. It's public. It says indoor, outdoor. It's really outdoor. And it's a gun sportsman club. So, yeah, that's a 4-H range. There's two ranges in Hobbs. There's a YT Dove Hunts in Andrews, Texas. And then there's Permian Basin Muzzle, Odessa, Texas. Now, I think there's a new range in Odessa that people might be interested in. If I had expanded it to 90 miles, then I would have been able to see ranges in Lubbock, Texas. And I'll go ahead and do that. And then you have Jake's Guns Incorporated in Midland, Texas. Midland Shooters Association, Midland, Texas. Tejas Shooting Sports. I think that's an archery range. Windwalker Farm Sporting Clays in Stanton. Lubbock Shooting Complex in Lubbock. And then you have a bunch of others in there, too. So basically, you can find ranges. It's there's ways to do it. It's not a problem. So go out there, find a place to shoot, and do so safely. 